get started and maybe people will filter in. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, good evening, everyone. I want to thank all of you who are on Zoom and in person for coming tonight to hear Amy talk about her art practice. Uh, before we begin, I, I'd like to thank uh, Roanoke City through the Roanoke Arts Commission for making this exhibition and its programs possible. Uh, for those of you here in person, the museum's open until 8 p.m. tonight. Um, for those of you who would like to visit the exhibition um, and see Amy's work in person, uh, this exhibition will be up through April 24th. And the museum's open Monday, or not Monday, Tuesday through Sunday, 12 to 5 p.m. And Thursday's 12 to 8 p.m. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce artist Amy Elkins. Uh, Amy is a visual artist currently based in California, uh, where she is completing her MFA at Stanford. She works in photography, installation, and sculpture, and has spent the past 15 years um, creating and exhibiting work that explores uh, the multifaceted nature of masculine identity, as well as um, psychological and sociological impacts of incarceration. Uh, most recently, Elkin's work pivots to explore notions of the self, some of what we witness in her series here on view of the Eleanor D. Wilson Museum. Amy has exhibited and published both nationally and internationally, um, some including the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, South Bend Museum of Art in Indiana, um, Kunstwald-Rhein in Vienna, and the Center for Creative Photography in Arizona, and many, many more. Um, Amy's first book, Black is the Day, Black is the Night, won the 2017 Lucy Photo Book Award, and it was listed as one of the best photo books of 2016 by Time, Humble Arts, Humble Arts Foundation, uh, Photo Eye, and more. Uh, even more recently, Chris Graves Projects is publishing a monograph of Amy's Anxious Pleasure series, uh, shipping May 2022. Uh, Elkins co-founded also Women in Photography with uh, Kara Phillips in 2008. Since its inception, Women in Photography has awarded over $17,000 in grants to artists and has collaborated with Aperture Foundation, Lightwear, Cumble Arts Foundation, among others, along with many independent women curators. And we are very honored to have Amy here to talk about her work tonight. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it on to you, Amy. Thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so I guess before I begin, I uh, would like to quickly thank uh, Kyra and everyone at Hollins University for organizing this exhibition and talk, uh, as well as anyone here that maybe isn't affiliated with Hollins that's taking time out of their day to willingly log on to Zoom. Um, so the installation photos that I've seen, like the one that I have up right now, look so uh, beautiful that I wish I could see them in person. Um, if you're local to the area, please go see it for me. Um, and I think, as Kyra said, it's up for several more weeks. And um, yeah. 
So I'm going to focus my talk today on a few things, including, of course, the work uh, that is up at the Eleanor D. Wilson Museum made throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but first, I'm going to before I, yeah, basically before I dive into these uh, cyanotype projects that I worked on, I wanted to touch on portrait work I've made and continue to make uh, that is quite different from that, um, surrounding maleness, masculinity, and vulnerability, as well as briefly touch on work I've made for the past 15 years um, regarding mass incarceration in the United States. And those are topics that I feel are deeply entwined that I have endless curiosity about. Um, and then I'll dive into how COVID uprooted and redirected my practice entirely, uh, like it did with most things for everyone. Um, so the first body of work that I made that specifically looks into male identity and masculine vulnerability is a project called Wallflower which I shot from 2005 to 2008. Um, and this is a series of portraits of men photographed in the only space that was readily available to me as a young artist, um, which was my Brooklyn apartment. And to make these, I, I created these small sets using floral backdrops. And I asked these, um, young men to enter this space and basically just like didn't give them very much direction just ask them to simply sit before the lens um and you know through this like organic experience of inviting people into this space um i became really interested in what would occur when one's maleness um, was placed within these staged domestic environments, often associated with femininity. Um, I was also deeply interested in witnessing and portraying uh, vulnerability and beauty, um, mostly of a population that is trained to deny these um, feelings and deny things associated uh, with being portrayed or perceived as, as female, right? Or feminine rather. Um, so yeah, as a, as a female identifying artist, I was really interested in engaging with why men are trained not to reveal vulnerability and women are expected to be um, vulnerable um, and live up to beauty standards. And uh, in some ways trying to reverse this gaze that you see throughout the history of photography and art where men are constantly looking at women. I, I wanted to engage with this. Um, I wanted to engage with this as well, uh, gazing upon the male species, if you will. Um, and these are just some of the portraits I made. This project, like I said, it went over numerous years and um, it mostly was uh, involving men in my immediate surroundings, um, young men that I would meet in a coffee shop or a friend of a friend. Um, and when they entered my space, the thing that I found most interesting, um, because I'm not the most outgoing person outside of using a camera, what I found most interesting about this work is that um, these encounters were so hypercharged because it was often the only time we were ever alone in a space together and we wouldn't be alone in a space together after these photographs were made either um, so it was just this fleeting moment of sort of this intense encounter um, between sometimes strangers um, and even if it wasn't a stranger just sort of this awkward encounter between friends in a way that you would normally not normally not have so and this project is um, ultimately, a lot of people knew me for this work for a long time. Um, this was a project that helped launch my art career. Um, I made it while I was actually in undergrad at School of Visual Arts in Manhattan. And um, it is work that landed me my first gallery representation through Yancey Richardson Gallery in New York um, shortly after graduating. Um, so 
I still am very fond of this work. It is very strange to look back at. Um, it's been a long journey. Um, but in 2016, I decided to return to this work. So nearly 10 years later, I came back to it. Um, but I tried to approach it quite differently. Um, as a young artist at the time of the original Wallflower Project, um, the work just felt very naive in hindsight, looking back, it was very limited um, by my understanding of masculinity and by my understanding of gender. And as I developed my, um, my understanding of the world around me as I age, like we all do, uh, I, I became interested in broadening this depiction of masculinity. And so in 2016, I decided to do more of an open call on the internet. And I did this specifically in the South and I can get into that if we have time later because the way that I work is very random. Uh, but I started working in the American South. I did internet open calls. I basically tried to find total strangers to photograph and then have them invite me into their space. Um, I still went with the backdrop. I still was very much interested in stripping all of the context of personal environment. Um, but in this particular case, I was very interested in broadening my understanding of masculine identity and um, invited anyone masculine identifying to sign up to be photographed. And so what I ended up with was a very broad range of people that were interested in being photographed. Um, and these are just some of them. Um, as you can see, there is a switch in the way that I was shooting in terms of format. So I've gone horizontal, um, which is not your typical portrait making um, framing, but I did this because through a lot of back and forth with my subjects and just gauging comfortable uh, comfort levels, rather, um, I realized that in, in framing horizontally and cropping at the shoulder, I could allow a much larger amount of people to sit comfortably before me as some of them um, were in various states of transition um, and they had like body parts they didn't want to photograph. And so by cropping at the shoulder, I could sort of strip down those gender identifying, um, you know, signs we walk around with on our bodies that we don't always associate with. Um, so I worked on this project on and off um, from 2016 to 2018. Um, technically, I'm still working on it. Um, I was supposed to go out and photograph in um, February of 2020, and that did not happen. My That was like the day of my flight, I think, was the day that the world was like very much panicking, canceling all their flights, hoarding to toilet paper. So um, I will return to this project at some point, but um, yeah. So in doing, in doing these sort of uh, projects, I guess um, something that I've just always been fascinated is this notion of, of beauty, right? And this notion of vulnerability and, and what that means, like in our society, we, we treat these ideas very differently. And, and I guess that's something I always return to even to this day um, is like sort of examining and questioning and challenging the ways that we are looking at vulnerability and gender and beauty. Um, And I can never tell in this abstract world of Zoom if I'm going too fast or, or what. I have a lot of work to share. Um, <laughs> so hopefully, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, we'll get to them at the end. But um, so to backpedal a little to the time I spent on the East Coast, I lived in New York for seven years um, before returning to the West Coast, which is where I'm from. Uh, so to backpedal a little to my time on the East Coast, um, in 2009, I met and began photographing a boy named Lucas, you see here, who had just turned 13 years old and was living in an apartment with his parents in Manhattan. And this project would span 
you know, quite a while. I'm still working on it. Um, and unlike most of my projects where I staged and planned endlessly, often backed by a lot of research with Lucas, I, I actually had no idea what was going to unfold or how long we would work together. I just knew that I was interested in documenting this boy on the precipice of becoming a man as long as he and his family would allow me. Um, so this is the first photograph I made of him in, I think it was just after his 13th birthday. In this project, I, I quickly became fascinated with the ways that photography allowed me to witness and preserve and elevate these sort of ordinary moments and changes in his life. And by not being present all of the time as an outsider, how amplified these changes occurred to me. Um, so whether that was the length of his hair, um, which you can see, or the use of a razor. In this one, he starts, he's already shaving, right? Um, or how he is sort of outgrowing his space in this small apartment that he shares with his parents. Um, or how his body language changed or remained constant. Um, how he, you know, laid his hands constantly in portraits. His hands became such a, an object of the portrait for me. You can kind of look at how he uses his hands in his portraits. Um, and his presence and attention to the lens, it was just like kind of this amazing thing. Um, so in this project, I guess what I was really like and continue to be like pretty amazed by is how the camera granted me this honorary family status in their home. And I think, you know, I touched on that earlier. The camera is like so extraordinary in this way that it can allow you access where you might not be bold enough without it. And I find that to be such a special tool for me to navigate the world with. Um, so here are just a few examples of us returning to a moment in a previous portrait out of this sort of joint curiosity about how much or how little has changed in this space over the years. I think that's these pictures, these portraits I think are three years apart. Um, and then this is the last portrait I took of Lucas uh, in 2019, which is just simply the last time I was able to get to New York City. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to getting back out there and photographing him again. But yeah, COVID hijacked many a flight and so did grad school. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, moving on. Um, around the same time I began photographing Lucas in 2009, I became interested in exploring other modes and sides of masculinity, including aspects of maleness often celebrated in our culture, which is athleticism, competition, aggression, success, play violence. Uh, both this project and Lucas overlap with work I began making about mass incarceration in 2009 as well that I will share briefly um, a little later. But maybe as you're starting to pick up, I often like working on way too many projects at a time and I often dip in and out of them throughout a large span of years in my life. And by doing this, I can let projects rest when I'm feeling stuck or when subjects aren't accessible or when I can't fly to New York, um, I can redirect my attention to making or researching new projects or picking back up on things that have been left simmering for a while. And I've always found um, that the work when I do this informs and intertwines with one another and inspires additional reflection or new ideas. And um, this seems to be the only way I operate as an artist. And I'm not sure if this would be maddening to others or not. <laughs> it's the only way my mind works. Um, so yeah, Lucas, this project is called Elegant Violence. So while I'm photographing Lucas in his apartment in New York, I'm going to rugby games. Um, oops, there we go. Uh, going to Ivy League rugby matches all over the East Coast. 
And while I'm doing both of those things, I'm writing inmates serving life and death row sentences around the country, um, among a couple other projects. But for this project in particular, I spent two years um, going to Ivy League great Ivy League matches and setting up these backdrops against the sidelines of the game. And um, this was often just like, I don't like a where they stored their equipment or um, just like a real kind of dingy location. And then I would just tape up a backdrop or get a backdrop stand and put something to cut the field away and focus just on the individual sitting before me. So these were photographed immediately after the games ended, often within like 10 minutes of them finishing. Um, and I was really interested in documenting the immediate evidence um, of such a brutally physical sport. Um, it's an 80 minute game with um, played in two halves and they don't wear helmets or if they do, they're like minimal, like little foam helmets. They don't wear any padding and they just pummel their bodies against one another. Um, and so I was just kind of blown away with what that endurance and physicality would look like as a result in a final portrait. So in this picture here, you can see, I don't know if you can see well on the screen, but there's blood smeared all over the front of his jersey and under his fingernails and his nose had been broken previously a couple times. Um, but I was interested in the aftermath of this physical feat, um, how they would hold their body language, what their facial expressions would settle on and like what their posturing or attempting of posturing would look like because they're so physically exhausted in these portraits. Um, and so, yeah, I was interested in this idea of play violence um, and, and obviously it's in this safe environment, right? It's set up by these universities um, and it's like this sanctioned space where you can, you can act out aggression and competition. Um, and it was really interesting as a female, artist type I'm sensitive I don't like violence and I would go and I've never been athletic and I would go to these spaces and these institutions that at the time felt so foreign I felt like such an outcast in these spaces and now I'm at Stanford so that's a whole other story but at the time I just felt like such a alien on these campuses and then they would fully allow me into these moments um of just like team, like adrenaline and camaraderie. Um, and it was such a fascinating project to work on um, that I've been wanting to return to a project like this for quite some time, actually. This guy, I always have to tell this story. This guy, because I don't understand sports like fully. So I'm like watching and trying. But the game is flying all over right on one side and then on the other side this guy and a couple other guys are in like what looks like a like a looney tunes cartoon like a cloud like just tumbling and uh they were just having their own separate moment and they were like just kind of fist fighting like scrapping in the corner of the game um and then when he sat for his portrait i just love that he has this slight smile on his face he's got blood in his Yale crest and on his neck and down his thighs and he's got blood on both of his wrists and um, but he was just really content um, with his experience on the field that day. Um, yeah and then this guy I, I just remember what, looking over right when this happened but he got kicked in the face with a cleat to let go of a ball and so he had like a hole poked on the side of his nose. Um, yeah so anyways <laughs> that was a fun project. Um, while I've been at Stanford, I was really dying to my first year here, um, work with some of the fraternities and athletes. Um, and again, COVID just really like ripped that rug out. So um, perhaps I'll get back to something like that soon. But um, anyways, that exploration of play violence that I experienced on the field led to this interest in exploring populations of men serving time behind bars. And this happened more organically than that. Um, but many um, 
of the men that I was interested in looking into in these spaces of incarceration were there due to acting on similar impulses of competition and aggression, right? But it's just a different result. It's a different space. Um, it wasn't sanctioned. And so I'm interested in that. I'm interested in that space. So while I was working with these college rugby um, players, I went on to start a project called Black is the Day, Black is the Night, which uh, Kira, Kyra, I hope I'm saying your name correctly, uh, touched on briefly in my intro. But it's a project that spans several years and it really opened my eyes to this just stark and complex realities of juvenile incarceration, capital punishment, and solitary confinement in the United States. Um, so for this project, I set up a PO box and through pen pal uh, services online, um, I found these seven pen pals and wrote them in the midst of very severe sentences around the country. Um, five were serving death row sentences and two were adults who had been sentenced to life for crimes committed as 13 and 15 year olds. And most of which were serving these sentences in solitary confinement cells about the size of a parking spot. Um, so while I was never able to visit or work face to face with any of these men, um, we corresponded for several years, which resulted in a variety of works that ranged from pixelated portraits to um, sort of these murky landscapes or sculptures all the way up to life-size life prison cells. And these were all in an attempt to depict the ways um, or like kind of just like dissect the ways that these intense sentences impact one's notion of self, home, and the world around them. Um, and like this part of my lecture, I'm just briefly touching on the work I made about incarceration because I want to get leave time for the work that's up in the museum. Um, so if you're interested in any of this work and more detail about it, it's uh, way more is available on my website than I have time to go over right now, which I'm sorry for. But um, so here's just a couple of quick examples because this is a portrait lecture. I'm just gonna show a couple of the portraits I made for this project. Um, and so, you know, I wasn't able to see these men face to face. They're in extreme, um, extreme lockup in various prisons around the country um, and access is either prohibited entirely or extremely limited to family. Um, so my way of trying to navigate that and still talk about or make portraits of people to talk about um, these topics that I wanted to bring attention to was that I went to their pen pal websites and I, and I used the portrait that was there for their pen pal um, biopic, right? And then I thought about like this idea of what incarceration does to an individual and how it strips away their identity so much that they have to pretty much reinvent themselves to survive. And so um, I made these algorithms um, that would strip the portraits away based on how old each of these men were and how many of those years they had spent in prison. So the pixelation and the distortion varies from person to person based off of these, um, these numbers. These are just a few. And then this is just a quick, just to give you context, it's just a quick installation photo. This is an exhibition I had in Tennessee um, where we were able to create a live size prison cell based off of a story that one of the men I wrote with had uh, shared with me. And in the picture as well, you can see these murky landscapes that I touched on earlier. Um, and those landscapes were created for each of these men based off of memories they shared of places um, of significance or homesickness. So um, yeah, I could go on about this project for sake of time. Um, I think I did not write the date I started making this, but around I think it's around 2016 or 17 is when I made this project, this is called the Golden State. And um, for this project, I was looking at the entire population of California's death row roster, which is the biggest um, death row population in the country. And it's not an active state. So there's just about 740 people sitting there and most of them will die of old age um, serving these sentences. Um, 
But in an election, I believe, I wish I wrote the dates. I don't have the dates with me. In an election, California election around 2016, it was on the ballot. Do you want to abolish the death penalty or keep it? And then there was another measure. Do you want to speed up appeals or leave them as is? And I figured in a liberal state like California, everyone would abolish it and definitely not speed up appeals. But um, California voters actually voted to speed up appeals and keep the death penalty in place. Um, and when they did that, the Los Angeles Times launched this interactive website um, saying essentially these are the 740 plus men you just voted to execute. And um, I was given access through that article that LA Times posted finally to what these individuals actually looked like. And the way that I went about using their portraits was to make these composite portraits. Um, and essentially it's an alphabet. And so I organized 740 some odd, mostly men um, by last name alphabetically. And so say I would have like 26 people with last names that start with A or five people that start with B. And I would make a composite of each of those letters, if that makes sense. And so what you get is sort of this mashup of, um, you know, like a racial mashup of who is on death row. And what you're left with is almost exclusively uh, men of color and yeah, men and men of color. So this is an installation of what that looks like in its entirety. Um, this was uh, an installation as part of a photo biennial at the School of Visual Arts Gallery in Manhattan. So there's 26 portraits, one for every letter of the alphabet. And I believe there's only two that have no nobody with that letter of the last name. And then there's one with like sort of a ghost image, uh, one person. Um, and the way to do that, sorry, I'm just steamrolling through stuff. The way that I did this work is, um, so say there's 26 people with the last name A, I would uh, do very low opacities, say like 10% and just line up their pupils on the tip of their nose. Um, and then as I'm compiling them, it's creating this new uh, sort of composited portrait out of all of them. Um, yeah. I have a few other projects. I think um, I'm getting closer to talking about the anxious pleasures projects, but um, while I was working on these projects, um, I've been doing this project continuously in Texas, uh, which is what's up right now called uh, Parting Words. And I started this project um, in 2009 as well. So it goes back to how many projects I was juggling in 2009. But um, when I started Black as a Day, Black as a Night, one of my first pen pals that I wrote with, um, his first letter back said, I have an execution date. Um, I don't know if you're gonna wanna write me. And it was of course very startling for me to get that reality so fast. And, um, and then I wrote with him and several months later, he was executed. And so with this sort of I don't know, this like profoundly like new reality kind of confronting me. I, I just kind of was combing the Texas um, criminal justice database to like understand what had happened and get any more information. And I came across this huge archive that they keep on every single person that they execute, including their last words. And so, um, I went on to make a portrait of every single man that's been executed. Again, it's like 99% men. There's a few women. Um, I went on to make portraits of every single individual in Texas that had been executed. And um, the way that I did it is I took their mugshot, their original mugshot, and I took the text that they said before they passed away. And, um, and I ran it through a program that recreated their portrait out of text. So these are just a few of them. So this one says, I hope you find it in your heart to forgive me. Try not to worry too much about me. Remember one thing, mother, I love you. And in this one, it just simply says, I am innocent, innocent, innocent. And these patterns that you're noticing, um, 
they are just sort of a result of this program that generates the text. Um, so a lot of this project was totally out of my hands. I just inputted the information that I had and then it generated the patterns and it generated the gradations of text. Um, this one says, I am not the monster they made me out to be. I got peace in my heart. And he's smiling in his mug shot. And I'm not sure the circumstances behind all of it. Um, this is an installation shot of parting words at Eastern State Penitentiary in Pennsylvania. Um, it's in one of the original solitary confinement cells there. And it was part of an exhibition called Right of Return that was really exciting to be a part of um, with some big artists like Jesse Crimes and some other wonderful people. Um, so that's sort of what one iteration of what this looks like in a space. Um, this right here, I wanted to use as a segue to talking about um, our experiences with isolation. Um, during COVID um, and when they had those enforced lockdowns, how that made us all feel. But this particular image is part of the solo exhibition I just had at the South Bend Museum of Art um, that was entirely parting words. So it was an entire museum space filled with every portrait that had been made for that project. Um, and then over in one side, which is what you see here, it is a taped outline of the average death row cell, which is about six by nine feet um, with eight foot high ceilings. And then those um, pieces in there are showing, if you can see in the smaller example, the metal cot and often a table that's just rudimentary, just like a piece of metal in the wall that you cannot move. And then a toilet sink combo. And so in this installation, we invited people to enter this space um, and feel the confines of such a place. Um, so all of that just sort of showing you like where I'm coming from, things I've been interested in. Um, and then of course, COVID just hijacked everything. Um, I was in the middle of working on several projects, all of them had to stop and I was suddenly just stuck on an empty campus. So um, I am going to read something that I wrote for this project that is in the book while um, I hope this works seamlessly, but it should just be playing images in the background while I'm talking. Um, okay, so in the spring of 2020, panic surrounding COVID-19 erupted and mandatory shelter in place orders went into effect, forcing me to abandon long planned portrait shoots, travel and work in progress in my art studio. I found myself in a 340 square foot apartment in a Bay Area neighborhood that was emptying by the day. The buzzing silence was profound. Two weeks into isolation, my drive to connect with others and make portraits only amplified. With no safe way to do so, I spontaneously turned the camera on myself to create a portrait. I printed it as a cyanotype, a simple 19th century photographic process that was only feasible due to the basic materials I happened to have on hand. A budget printer, a transparency film, and a package of fraying sheets of cotton pre-treated with cyanotype chemicals. At first I exposed the portraits in the unpredictable spring sunlight coming through my third floor apartment window before we were allowed to go outside easily. As the seasons changed, I went on to make them in a garden on the top of a car or on a patch of wobbly concrete tiles. I rinsed them in water and varying shades of blue emerged. I created a day, daily self-portrait using this technique for 377 days. I made most of these self-portraits inside various studio apartments that I lived in alone. To make the earliest pictures in the series, I had to move a couch every day to create space against a white wall near a window. I took others in fleeting spaces while traveling, in a guest room, in a medical examination room, 
during a pause in the wilderness and later against the wall of an old California bungalow sandwiched between the mountains and the sea. In the beginning, I often tried to cover as much of my body and face as possible as a commentary on my fear of the virus and my efforts to guard against it. My armor and props range from household items, potholders, tinfoil, dish towels, bed sheets, and toilet paper to more telling evidence of the unusual consumption that resulted from being stuck indoors indefinitely. Amazon packaging, takeout bags, trash left over from groceries purchased while wearing rubber gloves and sterilized in whatever way was possible later to be consumed. These items shifted as the duration of the pandemic blurred into an unknown stretch of time. The portraits became less about those initial fears and more about confirming the boredom, anxiety, grief, and fatigue of living in an indefinite isolation during a global pandemic. In total, I made these portraits for 377 consecutive days. I made the first, excuse me, my mouse just got in the way. I made the first portrait on March 20th, a day when my head was raging in pain, my throat was constricted, and the fear that I might have contracted COVID hung over me before testing was easily available. I made the last portrait on April 10th, 2021, the day I received my second vaccination. The days, weeks, and months in between feel like a fever dream, frayed and flickering in multitudes of blue. I think the images that are cycling right now are the the first quarter of the project, um, if you will. And I guess I'm just going to let it run for a little bit longer. Um, I only have a few more slides. But yeah, I so I titled this project Anxious Pleasures. I guess I could just kind of talk a little bit about that. I, I titled it Anxious Pleasures because like so many, you know, there was so much unknown, there was so much uncertainty, and I had so much anxiety with like how long this was going to go on. And so I found that by getting up immediately out of bed, which is the way I did this, I would wake up and immediately dig around and find these little costumes and things, props, whatever, right after waking up. So I was very disarmed. I didn't have <laughs> my full uh, caffeinated brain working yet. I was really allowing myself to be unfiltered and playful. And it brought me sort of this joy and meditation in this time that felt so shitty and endless. And so I just thought like, what better title than Anxious Pleasures? Because it was a pleasure I was doing to quell my anxiety. And some days it worked better than others. Um, but yeah. And the interesting thing about um, the last, well, the year that these were made is that I can look at one without even knowing the date. And I can tell you stories about them because they were so deeply personal on each day um, that it just sort of like ingrained like the narrative into my head about what was happening on a day, like in my life, in the greater context of my life at grad school, California. Um, but yeah. So um, this is my art studio at um, Stanford. And this, this was the first, um, this was as many as I can get on the wall. And I think this was a, uh, March to November of 2020. Um, so just to see it as an accumulation was interesting for me too, because I was experiencing them one day at a time. And then when I finally gained access back to my studio, which I had lost for a really long time, I pinned them up immediately and was able to look at them together for the first time. And then this is um, an installation um, that we had at Stanford in my second year here last year and um, just to sort of navigate how to show all the work without having the space to, we had four projectors turned in on themselves in a small room 
and it is what created the blue illumination on everything else in the room and each projector was playing um like one fourth of the entire amount that had been created um up until april 10th so that was a unique way for me to show this work that i would like to return to at some point and on the pedestal on the right is all 377 images uh, seen as a sculpture and people were only allowed to see the, the image on the top. Um, and then this is just the cover of the book um, that is currently on press in Italy. Um, as Kara had mentioned, this is through Chris Graves Projects. Um, a great friend of mine I've worked with on and off for a long time, um, but he was so excited about this work that the second I printed the last image. He's like, what are you going to do with it? And I was like, I don't know. And he's like, I think let's talk about a book. So um, yeah, it's, I'm excited to see it. It's got all 377 images in it. Each have their own page. It's like over 400 pages total. Um, and it's really exciting. I can't wait, but I, I'm going to end there um, because I realize it is 3.48 and I'll leave room for some questions, except Except for I, there we go. My screen froze. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, okay. Thank you, Amy. That was so wonderful. Um, at this time, if anyone has questions, please uh, put them in the chat, or I, I think you can even unmute if you want. Um, and yeah, I have a question, Amy. Um, to start us off, I I know you're eager to get back to some of your work on masculinity and on incarceration. Do you foresee continuing work about the self in, in one way or another? Um, I don't know. It is such a strange thing um, because when I was making it, it was about like survival. And now that they're out in the world, it's such a strange experience for me to be okay with <laughs> and I it makes me realize you know um or maybe not realize but just like remind me like what a vulnerable position people are in when they're the sitters of portraits right because you you sit for a portrait and maybe you don't know what's going to happen to that portrait so um I don't know that I will want to make portraits of myself but right now some work that I did not um share that I'm working on, it's not on my website or anything, um, are two projects that are very personal and pertain to family archives. And so it's not necessarily like me, but it's very personal and pertains to like my family and my family's history in California and um, some of the stories in my, in my family that are a little complex. Um, so in that regard, yes, I will continue that. I don't see any questions in the chat at this moment. Any any other questions from anybody? Trying to steamroll you guys. It's like I'm always trying to navigate how much to share. And I actually only shared like part of the work I've made. <laughs> so uh, it's always the complicated juggle of, of how much to share um, in a limited time. Was there a question? Yeah, actually, I've got a question. Um, ooh, ooh. Maybe not. Maybe type it. There is like a funny yeah, feedback um, on it. Oh, uh, Charles Lowney in the chat asks, which is your favorite uh, of the self portraits? Oh, man. I don't know. I have a lot of favorites, to be honest. Um, yeah, I have a lot of favorites. That's hard to answer. I love the the image on the cover. Um, I really, I really love that image. Um, I can try and share it real quick to see if it'll. But um, I don't know if that worked. I don't know what it's doing. Zoom is acting kind of weird on my end. Anyways, the portrait on the book um, cover of I had like a floral napkin behind me and then a floral scarf over me and then a floral fabric around me and a lot of it was like pieces from other projects that I had laying around my apartment um but I really loved the mystery in that one I really loved when I hid all the way <laughs> um I saw I saw another one in the chat 
from, oh, we got a couple. So from Kayla, she says, do you intend to work more with Man, there is some funny alien feedback yeah, happening. Yeah. Do you intend to work more with Carolyn? I'm muted. How strange. Yeah, it's very um, echoey. Um, I see a question. Do you intend to work more with cameraless techniques or back to digital prints? Um, I think, well, I just sort of touched on that. So like all of the work that I'm doing, which I worked on, so Anxious Pleasures went from March 30th to April 10th, so all, like over a full year. And during that time, I was relocated in Southern California. I was caretaking my father uh, while he was sick. And so utilizing that geographic location, I'm eighth generation born in the Los Angeles area. I really geeked out on um, family archives and history in that area and did a lot of um, work where I was using archives and not necessarily creating new work, but exploring work that had already been made and exists in the world, and then maybe creating a new archive out of that. So um, in that regard, I'm very interested in working in that way or working in alternative ways of making portraiture. Um, yeah, but I'm also excited to fly to Atlanta and make new portraits with my camera. Um, Perfect for the next question from Selden. She asks, uh, what drew you to the American South during your second masculinity series? Um, that's a good question. So yeah, I kind of touched on how my practice and my life in general is very organically just, I kind of follow currents. So if a current is occurring, that sounds funny. If a current is just happening on its own and it's of interest, I will, I will follow it. And so what happened was, um, I was doing an exhibition in, I was working on an exhibition in Tennessee, in Chattanooga, that required me to fly out. And I was also working with the curator at the High Museum in Atlanta. Um, and so I was, re I was already researching um, kind of some different projects I wanted to work on. Um, it was like a bodybuilding project that I, I actually shot but never released or did anything with but it was all in the um atlanta and george like areas around georgia or urban and rural georgia and so because i was already out there a lot i just i thought you know i really do love the way that photography allows access to other places and and people um i just feel like it's such a valuable tool and um and i was really interested in going someplace that I was not familiar with. I really love that feeling of going into unknown spaces and taking on that challenge. And so I think that was a big part of it too. Plus the American South has so many, like it's just loaded with so much history and it has such an interesting history in regards to like how, like just like with religion and conservative, it's like in, in Georgia and especially Atlanta, it's like, this sort of meeting ground of very liberal, very progressive ideas and then very conservative ideas. And I was interested in how that, those things like shape the understanding in that community about masculinity um, or just shape that conversation. So, yeah. Um, Tongva community, I see Janine. Um, Tongva is, um, native to the Los Angeles area. The Tongva tribe was in the San Gabriel region around Pasadena and Los Angeles. Um, my mom's side of the family has this really interesting history um, where they migrated up from Mexico into what's now California, but was Mexico at the time, whatever. It wasn't, it was all native land, but um, they were brought up. And when that happened, um, they sort of naturally seem to intertwine with the Tongva and the Chumash communities in the Los Angeles and Santa Barbara mountain regions. And so, um, yeah, the Tongva tribe is interesting. You should look up the history on them because it's in the San Gabriel region of Southern California, which is like, like I said, greater Los Angeles. But when the missions came into California and Mission San Gabriel was established, the tribe split. And it created this huge fracture that exists to this day. Um, 
the natives that decided to stay or were forced to stay. Um, the, the natives that stayed, like for whatever reason, because it's very complicated, um, they were then called the Gabrielino tribe due to the mission San Gabriel. The, the, the natives that left became the, like the Tongva tribe. And so the tribe actually split and it's, um, it's created like a lot of um, complications and hardships amongst both sides um, due to like colonization and, and mission, the missionizing of natives in California. So um, yeah. Thank you. There's some kind comments in the chat, lovely things. Any other last, last questions? All right. Well, I want to thank you so much, Amy. That was such a wonderful talk. Thank you for being oh, with thanks. us. Thank you for bringing me in. And for those of you here, the museum is open till 8 p.m. Love to see it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And Kyra, nice to connect with you after, I don't know how long ago it was on women in photography. Oh, oh I know, yeah. Uh, yeah, you you originally uh, also interviewed me for Ain't Bad. Do you remember I that? know, yeah. <laughs> That's so great. <laughs> the world is small. <laughs> All right, Amy, thank you so much again. All right, you're welcome. I'll be in touch through email and I hope the rest of the show goes great. Yeah. Bye guys. <laughs>